Welcome to the Better Business, Better Life show. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. In this podcast, I interview business owners, EOS implementers, and business experts who share with you their experiences, tips, and tools to help you create not only a better business, but also a better life. At the end of each show, you will have three tips or tools that our guests share that you can implement immediately into your life. If you want more information or want to get in contact, you can visit my website, debra.coach. That's D-E-B-R-A dot coach. Please enjoy the show. Today, I am joined by Di Manuel, who's from Vancouver over in Canada. And when I asked what I should introduce him as, he said, I don't like titles. And I went, yep, I'm with you. So this is just the guy from Vancouver. You'll find out a whole lot more about him on the podcast. <laughs> We've had a great little chat beforehand, and I'm really looking forward um, to sharing, um, so, well, for him sharing his story, because there's some really fascinating stuff in there. Welcome to the show, Di. Thank you, Deborah. I'm at, you know, just honored to be here. It's exciting. I loved our preamble before we hit go. And uh, <laughs> yeah. just, you know, I, I just feel like we're, we're from the same cloth, you know, like uh, just a lot of similar beliefs, similar, similar, similar journeys and stories, you know, or at least mm -hmm. lessons that we've learned, you know, so I'm, I'm excited to have this conversation today. This is great. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Hey, look, we were just talking about your journey. I mean, I you've done a lot in your years so far, mm. but could you just give us a little bit of a potted history of your, your journey to where you are now, some of the challenges mm. you kind of faced on the way, and I guess what you're most proud of as well, so from a professional and personal point of view. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, you know, I'll go way back. You know, I'm 46, staring down the barrel at 47 <laughs> right now, so it, it's coming this fall. Uh -huh. But, uh, um, <laughs> you know, if I go way back, um, those that know me, or when they learn about me, they, they instantly believe that I'm someone that's been around health and wellness my entire life. You know, people, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the adage, the cliche, you judge a book by its cover, right? So people meet me, they see me, they see the, how my actions are and how I live my life. And they just presume, man, it must have always been like this. You know how you meet fitness people and we're like, yeah, you've probably always been fit. You don't know what it's like to be unhealthy. And, I'm, I'm going to be yeah. honest. When I looked at your profile and I saw your photo, I thought, what does this guy know about being unhealthy? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of exactly the same. And it's, it's only when I chatted to you, it's like, okay, a different story. <laughs> and, and I get that. I totally appreciate that. And, and listen, when I, I was a kid, you know, age nine, um, my, my parents – separated and divorced. And, you know, I'm an 80s kid. I was born in the mid 70s. So I grew up during those influential years and, and impactful years in, in the 80s. And, and back then, you know, the, the divorce rates that we're used to today, statistically speaking, you know, over half marriages and in divorce now, where back then there was a lot of stigma around divorce. So yes. being as such, there wasn't a lot of conversations to be had. There was not a lot of support and resources to be there to help my brother and I, and as well as my parents, just navigate this thing, mm. you know, and they did the best they could, right? They did the best they could. And, you know, my, my dad left and my mom looked after my brother and I, but she had to work more to support us. And my dad was still supporting us too, but it was just, we had a lot of autonomy. And with this autonomy, this, this time by ourselves, I was dealing with a lot of emotions, a lot of emotions. And I mean, I'm like barely 10 years old. I'm, what am I supposed to be doing with all this stuff and these questions? And I figured out really quickly that I can influence my emotions based on certain things that I do and especially certain things that I eat. And so I played video games. I watched movies. And I also learned to eat certain types of foods. And it wasn't like I was there, Deborah, saying, hey, 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 Deborah, more salad, please. Uh, <laughs> you know? Yeah, none of that. None of that. It, it was eating very uh, nutrition poor food, yet very high in calories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it, we, we understand the math on this one. You know, we don't have to be someone that's in the fitness or wellness industry to tell us. But five years of that being my regular normal. By the time I hit age 15, I very distinctly remember the day my mom took me to the doctor's office and Dr. Quinn pulls my mom aside and is like, Betty Ann, Di is morbidly obese. Hmm. And my BMI was well into the 40s. And, and for those that are familiar with body mass index and how that works, like, you know, as a teenage boy that was barely 15 years old with a BMI well into the 40s, I was a very large kid. And, and it wasn't by accident. It's not like I had one poor meal and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, I got a weight problem. It was a compound effect over years. And, you know, along with all those emotions that I learned to eat really well, I, I, uh, 
I dealt with a lot of mental health challenges as a result, you know, because there was bullying at school. I, I was antisocial. Like I didn't, I was very introverted because I, I felt every time I was around people, I was being judged. Or if I saw people smiling or snickering instantly, I thought it was about me, you know, and it was just, it was really hard. It was just hard. Okay. And, and I can empathize with others that might be dealing with this right now. I mean, I'm just grateful that we didn't have social media back then. You know, like I just, I can't imagine kids today. Like, <laughs> nah. wow. And, um, at age 15, I had this moment, you know, and, and it's all I can say is it's this instant moment where I just made a decision after staring at myself in the mirror and feeling so disconnected with the person looking back at me. Like, that's just not me. That's not who I believe I am. And I don't want to be that. That's not my reality. As well as I was afraid of the idea if I didn't make any changes right then and there, things weren't going to be any better five years from then. You know, so at 15, thinking about by the time I'm 20 and I'm going to university because we were having those conversations, what do I want to do with my life? And I'm like, well, geez, I don't want to be like this. Mm -hmm. And I made a decision. I was like, I just want to get healthy. Now, I, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know how to do it. But I knew in me, I did not want to feel the way I was feeling anymore. And fortunately yeah. for me, my parents, they were very supportive, went out. I, I said, hey, I, I'd like to go get a bike. Can we get me a bike? Because I remember when I was a kid, I used to love riding my bike. Can we go get a bike? I knew I liked that activity. And my dad's like, yeah, let's go. And we literally went that afternoon. I shared, I want to get healthy. He's like, okay, what can I do to help? This, great, we went. And they took immediate action. And I'm so forever grateful for them doing that. And I just started to move my body every day, just a little bit. It was really hard, but I did it yeah. a little bit every day. And it started to make me feel better, think a little bit differently. And then I started to educate myself on nutrition. And it took me five years to put all the weight on, but it took me 20 months to take it all off. Wow. And, and so by 17, Deborah, I had this just whole new outlook on life and on myself. Yet there was still some emotional trauma there that I had never dealt with. You know, and, and a lot of people say, well, hey, I, I understand your intrinsic motivation there, but what was the extrinsic? You know, what was driving you outside of yourself? And I was like, well, I actually wanted a girlfriend, uh, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> I did full disclosure. I, I, you know, after unpacking that, I realized it was just because I wanted somebody to want me. You know, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to feel wanted. And, uh, you know, th that was something that I sort of carried with me. And so, you know, once I got into my early 20s or late teens, early 20s, I realized I was still very introverted, still dealing with a lot of self-esteem issues. Didn't matter how I was changing on the outside, on the inside, I still felt like that morbidly obese teenager isolated, withdrawn, and uh, dealing with a lot of other mental health challenges. And um, <laughs> it was weird, but uh, I remember going to a party and being offered a beer. And I remember having a couple. And all of a sudden, it was like all those inhibitions and those little thoughts that I had, they just seemed to go out the window. And all of a sudden, I found myself talking to people and being outgoing and energetic and being invited to go to other parties. Hmm. And all of a sudden... I started to believe that that person that I was when I was drinking was the one that people wanted to be around. Now moving to my 20s, I got into business, selling fitness equipment, very quickly excelled at that, got into a partnership arrangement with a, 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 a mentor of mine. 17 years, we scaled the practice to eight figures a year and really it was omnichannel. So it was online retail, it was manufacturing overseas, it was wholesale, and, and then eight retail locations as well. And I learned a lot doing that and I loved it. I loved it. Mm. How many staff did you have in that business? Uh, well, when you think about consultants and contractors and immediate full-time, part-time, uh, it, it was during uh, high season, uh, about 120 mm -hmm. to 130, and then lower season, usually in around the 80 to 90. You know, because there is a yep. seasonality, to, especially the fitness equipment. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's like yeah, yeah, basically the fall and winter very busy, spring and summer less busy. You know, so yeah, uh, yeah, um, yeah. We all kind of look at the yeah, and the and go, oh, well, how January. Are we January year? is crazy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it was great. But at the same time, while I'm scaling this business, I remember meeting my wife. I remember having my kids, and you know, really living into my ego, wanting to be that guy. You know, like the identity was so tied to this idea of what I thought success was. And I thought it was monetary. I thought it was title. I thought it was just people looking at me and thinking, wow, he's got it all together. Like it was just very surface. And I was very good at putting up those filters, you know, and um, my drinking was getting worse and worse. Like it was just more and more regular. 
And, uh, and I found myself compromising my values quite frequently, being able to sort of reason my way out of doing things that I normally, or reasoning to do things that I normally wouldn't do, you know, like mm. <laughs> turning my phone off as an example, being at the pub with the friends, purposely yes. turning my phone off to say, Oh, sorry, babe. I didn't know you called. Oh, my phone died. Yeah. Sorry. Like just right. stuff like <laughs> that. You know, my, my yeah. wife, my best friend, the mother of my children. And here I am lying to her being a bit of a dick for honest <laughs> yes thank you very much so yeah, a very yeah. big one you know mm. and and it, it was it was tough because that also creates a lot of internal strife for us you know when we have certain values that we espouse all the time to others and yet we don't show up like that for others especially for ourselves that accountability or agency it, it creates this little void and, and we often do things to either distract ourselves from that void or fill it and it's not usually healthy stuff you know and and so I found myself drinking, occasionally doing narcotics. I was even promiscuous. You know, I cheated on my wife. I am not proud. Still feel a little bit of shame around that. We've worked through it. I mean, this is now, you know, 15 years removed. But at that time in my early 30s, things are really crazy. And yet the business is still blowing and, and does up. It, does it? It was like crazy. Yeah, it's yeah. still doing really well. Yeah. yeah. And do you find that it, it kind of creeps up on you? Because um, we were talking about this before we came on the podcast, yeah. right? I mean, I think that um, my husband and I are just taking a bit of a break from alcohol at the moment mm -hmm. because we mm -hmm. actually realized that sort of literally every day when we came home, it was oh. the first thing we kind of reached for. And then the, the one glass became two, became yeah. three, became four. Before you know, it's a bottle at night. And, and, yep. and for him, it's more beer. So, yeah, did, it's the same with you. I mean, because I've, um, yeah. and to be fair, share, sharing really vulnerably, I've done nothing narcotics in the past too and it's you know it's so we've I think a lot of us may have actually been there and I think yeah. when you've got a high stress business you can often kind of you know turn to other things but did it creep up or was it you know how did it how did it manifest itself yeah it it, it was a well okay there's a couple things here so uh, one was I was purposely doing it at home so like I would often open the bottle of wine or have a beer or two or three, you know, uh, half sack by the time I get home at night and justify that yeah. my day was tough. I'd been talking and engaging with people and just running the business. So this is my way of decompressing, resetting, okay. you know, like all sorts of stuff. I could justify yeah. it uh, many, many ways. But I also found it was my association personally and professionally that also fed into it. And what I mean by that was a lot of the personal association I had, it was always revolving around alcohol and being mm -hmm. social with alcohol always present, always. Yeah. And so it was just, it was a social norm, you know, and, and it was, everybody was doing it. It wasn't like I had any examples or models of people that were doing it differently in my immediate circle. Mm -hmm. And so I was just doing what everybody else was doing and not thinking anything of it. And professionally, it was interesting. Here I am in the fitness and wellness industries. Yeah. And That's yet, what I was thinking. I mean, that, and, and oh. that your friends were also potentially in that industry too. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, I remember going to conferences and trade shows and it was crazy how unhealthy these people are. <laughs> and I mean, I'm one yeah. of them. Hey, listen, like I, I, I was one of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I was yeah. one of them. And, and I remember like we would do business on the conference room floor, right? We're doing our buys for the next year or something like that. And it's like, okay, we, we ink the deal, sign off. And then it's like, okay, where are we partying tonight? You know, like, and it was just like this, it, it was just, it was just normal. That was what we did. And, and I, it just became such a big part of my life, you know, that it was always present. And when I started to really recognize that I would often take, you know, even staff out for reward them for a great month. We hit some targets or maybe take some guys out for a lunch here and there. I would be the one encouraging to get a round of drinks. I'd also be the one that would be like, hey, don't worry, I'm here treating. Uh, let's get another round. And I would do that basically making sure everybody else got another drink only so I could get my own and not feel so guilty about it. You know, so I started to see these patterns, these little kinks in the armor were showing up and there was pretty apparent, but it's amazing how we got to sometimes get to that moment where we feel like we're rock bottom and, and then you realize, well, actually I can pick the rock up and I can crawl under it, <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and I, I, that's really where I got to, you know, and, and it was this fateful yeah. day getting home and my wife's looking at me, you know, she woke me up because I passed it on the floor beside her bed the night before. I don't remember how I got home. You know, it's like 11 a.m. the next morning and she's downstairs unloading the dishwasher with extreme passion 
Like, <laughs> waking up, everybody Good in the cul-de-sac. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I know what she was doing. She was doing it to make me wake up. And, and I got up, I came down, and she's looking at me like she's never looked at me before. You know, at this period in her life, we'd been wow. together for 10 years. And, and she just had this look. And I was like, oh, my gosh, there's something I'm really wrong here. And uh, mm-hmm. motioned me to the table. We sat down. And one of the first things out of her mouth was like, we have to talk about what we're going to do about the kids. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? Well, this isn't an environment I'm willing to raise them in anymore. You know, let's talk about what it's going to be like to co-parent our kids. Let's talk about where you're going to be living. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> what? Like, yeah. And it was like this, this instant, like, what is going on here? And, and I'm really hung over at the time too, which doesn't make anything better, but, it, and it's just, it was just like this bomb was dropped on me, but it, you know, truth be told, it wasn't like it was a surprise. I knew it was coming. I mean, eventually, like she's a very strong-willed woman. She's a redhead, tinge of ginge all the way. And uh, <laughs> she's fiery, right? She's going to tell you the way it is. And so, and that's why I love her. That's why I love her. Yeah. And and uh, she asked me a question, Deborah. And in this conversation, we sat at that table for a couple hours, you know, and there's tears being shed both directions. And, and, you know, we both love each other still very much at that moment. But she was not loving the situation and she wasn't loving how I was showing up regularly. Hmm. And she asked me, Di, are you being the type of man you would want to marry your daughters? Whoa. Yep. It was one of the most, pardon the pun, but sobering questions I could have ever been asked. You know, it was in that instance I realized, well, I mean, if you think about it, Deborah, because I know you can speak to this really well, you know, how do we all learn as human beings? Well, we learn through role modeling and through mentorship. You know, those are really the two primary ways that we learn. And, you know, when she asked me that question, I started thinking, well, what am I modeling to people? My kids, mm-hmm. my family, my friends, my communities, my employees, my, 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 my business partner. You know, like, what am I modeling? And how am I mentoring people? And I realized, like, man, if somebody like me showed up on my doorstep... <laughs> There's no way they're coming in. Like, no way (laughs) as that guy that I was. And yet that's what I was saying to my kids as a man, as a father, as a husband, as a brother, as a business owner. And and it was right in that moment, similar to how you and your husband are taking a break, I I decided and I committed to taking one year without drinking. And I know there's going to be people like one year. It sounds like you were an alcoholic. And it was like, no, I was fully conscious of my decisions every day. I chose to mute my phone or turn it off. I chose to get another round. I was aware of every decision I made. I never really felt out of control unless I purposely got myself out of control, you know? And, and so I'm fully conscious. The alcohol wasn't making me drink it. (laughs) I wasn't powerless against it. I was knowing what I was doing. And, and yet I kept saying yes to alcohol and saying no to my life and everything that I'd been working so hard for. And, and literally in that instance, I decided to take one year off. And in the first three months ever, I realized, oh my gosh, what have I done? This is hard, wow. <laughs> you know, it was hard. <laughs> yep. and, and back then I wasn't a very vulnerable person because again, all my circles of influence, nobody was vulnerable. All the guys were like very, mm, mm, we're men. We don't talk about that stuff. You know, like it was just rough and gruff and, and grit and you work hard. You talk about business all the time. You talk about life very superficially, but it's all about just that and 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 so that wasn't being modeled so i didn't know how to be vulnerable i didn't know how to ask for help and um three months in i i did a big verbal dump on my wife i literally it was the first time in our 10 years together that i told her exactly how i was feeling and everything i was struggling with like i'd never done that before with anybody to be honest and she's looking at me and thank goodness you know she was very kind she looked at me she she heard me she was very present with me sharing didn't interrupt me. Let me just get it all out. And she looks at me. She says, well, thank you. You know, it's going to be okay. And I think you should talk to somebody. <laughs> you know, so I, it was like, oh, okay. It's that. That's where we're going. Because it's true. I know, you know, she can't be all that for me. She can't help me with that. But, it, and up to that point in time, I'd never thought about it. I always thought that would be a weakness. To go get mental health support. Go see a mental health professional. A psychiatrist. No, I don't do that. I don't need that. I'm not crazy. Like, like that was what I was thinking, right? And and yeah. my belief system. And uh, I started working with a psychologist for six months, a, a therapist, which is a relationship therapist for my wife and I. And one session in, she's like, Christy, uh, I think Di should come back by himself. 
you know, so it was like, <laughs> like I, this is full disclosure. I got no problem sharing this story now because again, it, we're, we're, I'm coming on, you know, it's, it's been a long time removed, but it was such a critical moment in my life. And this is the, the long winded answer to your question. My, my personal and professional, the thing I'm most proud of was making that one year decision, a decision to go one year without alcohol. Because at the end of that year, my wife's looking at me and she's like, oh, die, you did it. And I'm like looking at her. And I'm like, I did do it. <laughs> you know, like I'm like, holy smokes. And, and she's like, well, why don't tonight we, we share, a, a, you know, a glass of wine and watch the sunset. And I'm like, wow, that sounds really nice. But then I was like, you know, Christy, so much has happened in one year. Like so much had changed. So much, like not only my health, my energy, how I was showing up at work, how I was leading our company and our teams, the feedback I was getting, even suppliers, and even my personal passion projects that because all of a sudden I had all this energy and extra resources, I started doing things that I'd always wanted to do, but never done like Toastmasters. And, and I had a couple other networking organizations that I started to participate in. And, and all of a sudden I was just feeling fulfillment from all these different ways. And I was like, you know what? So many things have changed in one year. What do you think would happen if I just kept going? I'm coming up on 14 years now since I last had a drink, you know, and and uh, I, I have no qualms that I could pick up a drink and I wouldn't have any problems with it. But I just it's just not part of my life anymore. And I just don't feel I need it. You know, like it's just like, yeah, I'm good. And uh, yeah. And that that was honestly the, the thing I'm most proud of, you know, was being able to now yeah. look at my wife. And when she asked me that question, are you being that kind of man that you want to marry your daughters? I'm like, hell, yeah, I am. Hell yeah, <laughs> you know, and and uh, that's that's really where you know things sort of stand now because everything changed. You know, after I went through that big change, I realized that the path I was on professionally wasn't fulfilling anymore because I changed so oh, much. Yep. I ultimately left that career after seventeen years. You know, and, and just have been pursuing other things ever since. Fantastic. Hey, look, thank you so much for sharing, particularly so vulnerably. Um, I have to say, I, I think your wife sounds like an amazing woman and I'm she really is. pleased that um, she, she, yeah, that you, you guys are still together because thank she's you. obviously very good for you and, and yeah. you're probably good for each other. So yeah, yes. well done. Okay. So, so that is, I mean, I, I think I, I would think a lot of people listening can probably relate to this. Mm. Um, I think that uh, even just in a couple of weeks of, of taking off from alcohol, I've just found that I've got a lot more clarity of thought. Yeah. It does sort of, you have more time as well because yes. you're not sitting down. Um, I mean, I'm not so much an outgoing person in terms of going out to the pub but we would sit at home and we would drink and, and the evening would be drinking sitting in front of tv eating yeah. that was kind of it whereas now we've actually got time to other things i think that the environment thing is really fascinating because of course mm. uh, in a lot of business situations it's not just the, the gym um, industry but you know a lot of our networking events are based around alcohol and i was really really relieved when i went to, I, I do a talk every year at university oh, and cool. i actually talk to the students and i talk to the in the the, the science um, and and technology, the STEM, the STEM part of the business, because that's Wonderful. my background. And I talked to them about networking, and I went to this networking event to talk about networking with them, and they had no alcohol. And I was like, wow, this is actually pretty cool, because back in the day when I was at university, I'm a little <laughs> bit older than you, you know, everything was based around alcohol. So it was yeah. actually really good to see they, they served healthy food, they had no alcohol, um, and they were encouraging that kind of healthy way of life, which I think oh, is really great. That's wonderful. So cool. It I is, wish more yeah. people would adopt that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah? Wow. So, so it is. It is tough, though, isn't it, when you've got those industry um, things yes. that you're getting together with, and that's the expectation. I actually got to the point where um, uh, I used to actually, because I run an actual connector community where we all get together once a month, and we have some education, we have wow. some networking, we have some strategy stuff, and then we have the drinks and nibbles afterwards. And yeah. I got to the point where I now take a bottle of zero alcohol wine with me, and I give it to the barman, and I say, when I come over for a drink, just pour me this one. So it feels like I've still got a glass of wine in my hand. It yeah. looks like. I've got a glass of wine in my hand, but I, I'm not actually drinking alcohol. I love that. That's a wonderful strategy. Yeah. And I, I think everyone should take note of that because I, I was similar. I had sort of um, moved to just having bubbly water or, or club soda with lime mm -hmm. in it. And often, you know, people look at that, they like, can be a gin and tonic for all they know, you know, like it's just, it, it's simple enough. Like I, and it's weird, right? Like I think, you know, if we're talking about sort of this social norm aspect of, of just how do we interact with others when they've made this kind of decision, I find early on, especially, you know, this is going over a decade ago when I would share with people, no, I, I don't drink or I'm not, you know, I, I would say no, you know, everybody else is ordering alcohol, I'd order yep. or something else. Instantly, people would presume, okay, 
why don't you drink? You know, like instantly to them, it's like, oh, oh, I wonder if he's got a drinking problem. You know, like it was just like, yeah. it was just so quick for people to judge where now I am finding that more and more people are just choosing to have a lifestyle where they're prioritizing health. And that just doesn't fit in the equation right now. You know, I'm not to say yeah. it's a never thing. I'm not here to vilify alcohol. You know, I'm not here to say it's a bad thing and don't do it. I'm not, that's not my, my purpose. But my purpose is to say like, hey, if there's certain areas in your life that aren't measuring up to what you like them to be, mm-hmm. You got to start looking at certain things that might be holding you back from being optimal, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and also financially, you know, what's holding you back from being optimal in those areas. And chances are things like alcohol might be holding you back a bit, you know, (laughs) so take a pause, just take a pause. Like what you're doing, Deborah. I think you're being a wonderful example for people of what's possible. It's just taking a pause, you know? Yep, absolutely. I mean, I think for me, it's about just yeah, knowing that it isn't um, a, a habit um, yeah. and that it's actually something I can choose to do or choose not to do. That's really important. Going back to your original story, I think also mm. you, you, know, you talked about you as a 15 year old. And I think sometimes I call it the spiral of doom. Like when we get into when we get into a, a bad place in our business, um, mm. it just we just keep kind of spiraling downwards and things get worse across all of our areas of our life. I mean, I, I've personally been there where, you know, the business isn't going well. And so then mm. you start to drink a bit more and then you sort of start to, you know, do a whole lot of things and it feels like it's just getting worse and worse and worse and sometimes it can be hard to kind of pick yourself up and 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 make a decision to move forward I love that when you were a 15 year old you basically went okay I need to do something um you know there's no point in kind of pretending that at, at, as, a, as a morbidly obese 15 year old that you can suddenly become a gym bunny overnight but you went okay what do I like and what can I do what's the sort of the yes. tiny little step I can take towards it um and to getting a bike and going yeah I like bike riding I can start to move on the bike you don't have to become a Tour de France winner in the first week of doing it, but it is just about bringing in those small incremental changes. I mean, right. Atomic Habits, um, James, whatever his name is, yes. he talks about James it all the clear. time. It's like little yeah. things yeah. that will actually make a difference. Yeah, James Clear, that's his name. Thank you. Yeah. So so in terms of business, you know, you must have also had challenges in the business yes. um, yeah. around, because going from, you know, two people to 130 staff is, is huge. <laughs> was it was it all plain sailing or, or really easy? <laughs> no, it, it's actually kind of funny because um, I, I mentioned I got hired on to this company and that's when I met, you know, mm. my soon, you know, who would ultimately become my business partner, but also my, really a mentor of mine. And he was a joint venture partner with a, 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 a competing brand. Like ultimately it became our competition right. later. But at that time, oh. he was a joint venture partner in our trade market. So he basically had the rights to our province, you know, for those mm-hmm. in the States, it's like your state, you know, like he had that rights, that territorial rights. So any stores that would open or any commercial B2B type enterprises that would be initiated, it would be him that would be overseeing that and sharing with his partners. And, uh, you know, things were all good until they weren't. And him and his partners, <laughs> let's just say they had a, a falling out and right. there was a divorce <laughs> and they agreed yep. to disagree. Um he ultimately left. He had a couple existing stores, just a couple. There was two stores specifically that wanted to keep. Um, they took over everything. Like they literally took everything. All we ended up having was just that inventory because they had control of the bank accounts and all the assets, except we had these two brick and mortar locations. Mm. And and so during this transition, actually a lot of us that worked for the company were offered money not to show up because they were trying to sabotage him. They were trying to basically pressure him out to sell. Right. And he'd already been doing this for a long time. And he's like, I'm not getting out of this industry. I got kids that are just growing up and they're going to have to go to university. I'm, I'm not ready to just, you know, hang it up. And um, yeah. I, I remember him asking me, he's like, well, hey, you know, the, the, I, I was his number one guy. I had the relation with him, not with his partners that were out in Ontario. So way out east, another part of the country that really had no relationship mm-hmm. with us other than on our pay stubs. And uh, I was given an opportunity. I was given an opportunity to basically be given, you know, what I sort of warmly relate to being the golden handcuffs um, <laughs> later. But I, I was <laughs> given a great equity position because he knew I had 20 years as junior, had the energy, the fortitude, but also the skill set to be really mentored into being a, a replica of him, you know, and, and, and even yeah. then some. 
you know, because I had a lot of different views. I'm much better with computers. And then when marketing came around, like I just, I was more in tune with all that. And uh, so that's what started off. And, and obviously as we're scaling, as we're trying to grow, there was a lot of hurdles we had to get over, like establishing new relationships with new suppliers because those existing brands were going to stay with the national company, didn't want to go off with just some little two store company, you know, in fear of losing that overall volume. So we had to regain those relationships over time by just doing what we do and doing it really well. And that was serving a customer base, helping them with their needs, getting them a great product, a great experience, but ultimately helping them get their health and wellness results. Because if they get the results, everybody asks them, what have you been doing? Well, actually, I bought some equipment from Fitness Town just down the street. You should go check it out. Talk to Di or talk to James or talk to, you know, talk to one of the guys. Mm -hmm. They'll help you out. And, and so that word of mouth referral was just tremendous. And then, you know, as social media came about, I took an active interest in that, both personally and professionally, decided I want to learn it. I remember reading Gary Vaynerchuk's first printing of his book, Crush It. I remember reading it on the plane, going to Ontario, literally go visit my mom. And I was like, wow, this is a game changer. This is where everything's going. You know, and by that time we were advertising in the media, like on print, <laughs> on radio, <laughs> on TV, yep. you know, and sponsoring events. And we still would do events. They were great. But those other three traditional medias, you know, they were diminishing returns year after year. We were spending more and getting mm. less. And yet on social, I was just doing all this stuff organically through storytelling, through sharing, you know, stories of clients and their successes and just just having fun with developing relationships online. And our business just kept growing. You know, um, but there's yep. hiccups, you know, there was like 2008, a little bit of an economic crash, right? Uh, mm, that affected yes. our retail yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, discretionary dollars. Yes. Fitness equipment is discretionary. Come on, let's be real. You know, like, definitely. you're worried yeah, about yeah. losing cash, you're not going to go buy a treadmill, you know, like it's, <laughs> and, and so um, we, we had to sort of navigate some of those economic ups and downs, but we, we were, we were resilient. We were able to get through it. And uh, when I left the business, it wasn't a great time to leave. Um, I didn't get like a huge check or an exit, you know, but I had enough that mm. it gave us some space to to do a couple things and, and basically lean into the things that I wanted to start doing, which was supporting people really in the one on one, doing more speaking, um, yeah. offering digital online solutions for people and, and consulting, you know, like something that gave me a lot more flexibility with time and place. And uh, and that's what I transitioned to that I've been doing the last eight years, you know. Mm. I think what's really interesting about that story is, you know, I think that um, a great leaders are always reading and always educating themselves and always, you know, seeing what's really mm. going on because it's very, very easy. Again, when you get really busy with business and you've got this, all this, uh, um, all this stuff going on, good and bad, yes. um, making time to actually read, making time to do research. If you don't do that, you can get left behind. I mean, obviously, reading Gary's book, you know, was it was it was an eye opener. There would have been other businesses in the same industry that didn't read, that didn't kind of pick up on that, and may have gone way too long still doing traditional media and not building up that uh, that social media presence and the online presence would that yes. be fair to say yes very well said yeah. you know it's uh and even today like uh, and i i think that i know a lot about that stuff but i really know very little you know like because it, it's changing yeah. so quickly and now with this oh, so you know, chat gpt and all the ai functionality and i i'm like whoa, <laughs> you know, like, whoa, it, it's hard to keep up with all that stuff. And, and I think, yeah. you know, this is one thing to take note on is I remember one piece of advice that we were given was this idea that, you know, there's often people in your organization that might be younger, maybe don't have the, the, the life experiences or the work experience of some of their senior uh, um, associates and, and partners, but they themselves have grown up with access to technology and they don't know a world without it. And often to them, it's just normal. And, and so we were starting to allow a lot more input from those younger people that we were bringing on, you know, into our marketing, into what we were doing in the stores and outside of the stores. And, and that was really valuable, you know, like from a, a, a company, but also a culture standpoint within the organization, mm -hmm. because now people felt like they had a voice and it didn't matter how long you had been there and how old you are and what you'd done in your life. Like it was just everyone had an opinion and, and we mm -hmm. would weigh out the opinion and discuss it and yeah. and it would influence a lot of the direction that we went and sometimes it worked <laughs> sometimes it didn't but you know what it, it it was good because we were all going the same direction you know and, yeah. and i think that was the critical piece is allowing people on your team that are good at doing what they do and like doing what they do 
well, give them the space yep. to do it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> we call it delegating elevate, and it's really about letting people, you know, um, elevate themselves up to their unique ability where they add the most value. Uh, and so that's the stuff that they love doing and they're great at doing. It's usually where they add the most value to the business too. But I think you've made a really valid point. I think sometimes, particularly for us oldies, you know, mm-hmm. of thinking about letting the young, young ones kind of get control of things. But yeah. this is native for them. They've grown up yes. with this. You know, you, you, my niece who's just about to turn 16, mm-hmm. I mean, when you watch her with technology, she's always got earbuds in. She's always listening to something. Oh, there's multiple things going on around her and I kind of go how do you wow. concentrate but actually know. she does and she's very very smart and she she passes all of her exams and so you know you can't critic critic critique her because she's actually doing very very well but th- yeah. it's a different way of living and they have been brought up with it from you know a, a baby effectively that's right it's so true yeah it's yeah. like they won't know a world okay. without it and if they do know a world without it we've got bigger problems to worry about so it's like okay <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's, it's here to stay and um uh, it's amazing what the the youth can do today that that I just think back to when I was at Morbidly Obese Teen. I was like, oh, and I am. I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful the internet wasn't what no, it is today. Media. You know, it's like, wow, yeah. that social pressure that they deal with is just immense. Mm. I'm actually a, a trustee on the Life Education Trust, which is a, a, a trust that kind of helps um, kids be the best version of themselves. Oh, so it deals amazing. with all kinds of things. It deals with the drug issues. It deals with the alcohol issues. It deals mm. with, with edu- um, f- education around food and fitness. And oh, it's it's basically gir- the, Harold the giraffe is actually their mascot. And the reason why they chose a giraffe was that you're always looking up um, at, at the, you know, looking up rather as opposed to being worried about what others are thinking of you. So yeah, it was just, it's really, it's really interesting like because, that. you know, obviously we're, we're bringing in programs now around you know, online bullying and around all the stuff that goes on and I tell you what I we had a great speaker the other day who talked about some of the dangers of kids having access to the internet and he was very very strict about not letting his kids have mm. a phone in their bedroom or any technology in their bedroom and he started to share some of the stuff that they have access to and I have to say I thought I was open-minded my mind was blown it was like wow okay so <laughs> it's a different world but um it is what it is we can't you know we can't change it we have to work with it true True. And yeah. is, was those conversations captured, like that presentation? Is that something that's like available in the, yeah. the ether, the online ether? I would love to hear that or see yes, that. The- there's actually there's a really they actually did a really interesting project where they um I, I'll find the details and put it yeah. in the in the link from the podcast Please. I can't remember exactly what it is but they they basically got this they 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 pretended to be a young female online and put her across all the social platforms but it was actually being run by an older lady yes um and it was just and they actually monitored you know how quickly this young lady young young girl was contacted by older people the kind of things they were asked for. Or the oh. sort of the scams that they get drawn into because it's very you know they'll go I'll oh, just send me a, a nude photo they send a nude photo and now they've got ammunition to actually hold them to ransom for a whole lot more it's like it's Blendous. it's fascinating the, the, the oh. documentary is actually really really interesting wow <laughs> but I, we're going a bit it, off topic as a father but, I mean, of two daughters I'll tell you that scares the crap out of me <laughs> 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 yeah, it really does. I know I know and so it's re- what was really interesting was you know and I, I I love talking about boundaries in business as well like people mm. need to know what the boundaries are people we as humans we actually quite like boundaries yes. and he was he had what would be considered fairly fairly strict ones which is there's no technology in the bedroom on your own if you want to use a phone or a computer you do it out in the open where everybody in the family can see it um and after, at first i thought gosh that's draconian you know what is yeah. wrong with this guy and then after hearing the presentation seeing the documentaries like actually i think that's not such a bad idea and he said look sometimes my kids hate me you know they they get really stuck into me you're you're being restrictive you're you don't understand what it's like and he's like yeah um i'm okay with that because <laughs> i know what the other the other side is yeah um, and I, I think back to my parents and, and I'm I'm I don't know you talked about I'm, I'm a bit older but my parents also were in that era where nobody ever got divorced they mm. stayed together mm. I'm not entirely sure they should have stayed together there were times mm. when you kind of went you know I think they were staying together because they felt they had to rather than they really enjoyed each other's company right. but one thing I will say is they were they were bloody good parents I mean they were they yeah. were very very strict and I hated them for it but gosh I am so grateful for them these days it's like I, you know um, the, the the things I learned from them around values around morals um very very grateful <laughs> we're, we're fortunate that way because it's i mean i i love that you're saying that because i also think it's it's important for us to remember and reframe sort of those histories that we've had because as much as it was such a brief period as kids that we actually had in our whole scope of life it's such a small period right mm-hmm. but it, it's yep amazing when you sort of think back to that emotions that we dealt with you know as teens right like i I know i keep reading studies that talk about you know 
girls and, and like youth brains aren't fully developed till they're like 25. I'm like, well, mm -hmm. that actually yeah. explains a lot because in my early 20s, I was still just immature and doing stupid things and then uh, that's why yes. okay <laughs> you know i still don't think my <laughs> so, brain's so matured the... but uh, i'm working on it you know, so. <laughs> uh, my husband often reverts to being seven it's all good yeah. uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's interesting trevor grice who actually founded the life education trust he did a whole lot of research on the brain and how the brain works and it actually men, um, men or boys develop a lot uh, take a lot longer to develop as really? well so that okay. frontal lobe part of it yeah so 25 years before they're actually full and if you if you start using any drugs or alcohol before that brain is fully formed it can have an impact long term on, on you as well so it's really important that and yet if you think about it I mean gosh I don't know about you I mean I at 17 I was starting to rebel against my parents I was doing things mm. I probably shouldn't have been doing and yeah. and all the way through my early 20s and probably didn't really settle down until I I got married and then um even then I'd say there were some some moments yeah. there where I hadn't really quite <laughs> settled down <laughs> But, you know, um, that's that's the time when, when we're the, the formative years that we shouldn't be putting stuff into our body, but we do. But, yeah, anyway. <laughs> it's wild, right? I know. It's always that yeah. sort of like hindsight. It's not always 2020, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it sure could be if we let it. Oh, well. Uh, I mean, I, I do think that, though, and the same goes with business, right? I think that actually sometimes the mistakes that we make give us much greater lessons than, than the successes that we have. Well because, um, and, and this is why part of the reason I started this podcast is I think that we see lots of success stories out there. And don't get me wrong, I love success and I love celebrating success. But there's also, you know, I think a lot of us learn more from our mistakes on the way than we necessarily do from the successes. And it's certainly true. that's been my my story. Yeah. That's, that's well said. Gosh, um, yeah. Um, so in now, what, so what are you doing now? You said, you know, so you had this oh, kind of epiphany, yeah. <laughs> this no longer was for you. You're doing the talking, you're doing the one-on-one -on -one co um, co coaching, you're doing the online stuff. What is the kind of person that you love to work with? What's your ideal person? Well, I, I like people that perform at high levels in, in areas of their mm -hmm. life. And when I say that, like professionally, especially like people that are, are really just, I mean, it takes a lot of grit to be an entrepreneur you know, and resilience. Like it just, it just does. It's not smooth sailing. I mean, talk to anybody with a startup, they'll tell you. It's like, I mean, I'm, I'm part of a startup now as a fractional CRO and, and I'm oh. like, wow, I forgot what it's like to be doing this stuff. And I'm like, wow, it is like every day, right? Putting on the boxing <laughs> gloves, stepping in the ring and yep. let's go another round, you know, like it, it's, it's, <laughs> and you have to have that, that grit to just keep doing it and be okay with mm -hmm. the big nose that you continuously get. Right. And, yeah. uh, the knockdowns, and, the knock yep. and so, you know, I like connecting with people like that because I know that they already have a certain ability to do hard things, you know, things that are going to make them feel uncomfortable because that is one thing we have to get somewhat comfortable with. Okay. If we want to navigate any significant changes in our life, like any changes that we navigate, it's rarely easy, but it's almost always worth it. But when you're going through change, it's like awful. <laughs> you know, sometimes it is. It's just <laughs> awful, right? Like it's like yeah. you can't see, you know, three inches in front of your face, but then you get through the change or you get over that first big hump and you turn around and you look at where you've come from and you realize, you know what, now looking back on it, it actually wasn't that bad, but it's yeah. just that perspective shift. And, and so mm -hmm. I, I find that people that are working really well professionally sometimes are underperforming or feel sheepish in their personal life. So they will yep. retreat and do more in their professional. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Like they'll, they'll, they'll just take whatever time they would have and they, they become workaholics. They become obsessive mm. with just working in their business. And it creates this um, lack of harmony between personal life and professional life. Because it it's all about harmony. It's, you and I had a great conversation before we, we started today, you know, talking about this idea of balance, right? And it's like, well, yeah. if you think about balance you know, like a teeter-totter, you, you've got the weight over here on this end. Well, I'm shifting my attention to where the weight's down. Oh, now I want to get the other end up. Okay, I'm going to turn my attention to the other side. Oh, inevitably, yes. it goes down. Uh, it's like, mm -hmm. I can't keep my eyes on two different separate places at the same time. So it's not about trying to balance them. It's about how do you get them to work together to create the greatest amount of fulfillment, joy, and happiness, oh, you know? And, and I think that is the person I love connecting with most is the one that's struggling with that harmony. You know, and, and because I, that's I, I love helping them find it, you know. Yeah. 
and I, I love you said it's not easy, but it's worth it. I yeah. actually, I was very fortunate, very grateful to have gone and done Outward Bound, which I'm not sure if you have in Canada. Yes, but yeah, it is, it's it, amazing. Yes, you do? Okay. Yeah. So I was 40, 43 years old, I think, at the time, wow. probably the oldest, fattest person on the course. Uh, um, but I did it. And and after I'd finished you. doing it, they actually asked, you know, would you like to sponsor a brick? They have this this walkway of bricks that, that have little messages on them and, and sponsors' oh. names. And I didn't want my, I didn't want my name on it because did, it wasn't that bad that for me. But I actually literally had stamped onto the brick. It's not easy, but it's worth it because oh. that was my take out from Outward Bound. So. No way. That's, <laughs> That's hilarious. So cool. yeah. I love it because it's true, um, though. It's so yeah. true. Yeah, what a great thing to put on. I mean, I had, to, I had to run twelve kilometers on the last day of Outward Bound, and I am, I'm a, I'm not built to run. B, I was, I say, overweight and and certainly not fit. Um, but there was no, you know, I learned that you could do it if you put your mind to it. You absolutely could do it. I could do anything I wanted to, and that was the biggest takeaway so that I took cool. away from Outward Bound is that, yeah, yeah, Good for yeah, you. still not all that great at climbing um, rock rocks, you know, sheer rock faces. Yeah, right. but I did it. <laughs> yeah. I don't think we're meant to do that. Um, <laughs> and I, <laughs> It's all good. Uh, so it's called put. Yeah, it's all called pushing the boundaries, isn't it? Okay, brilliant. Um, so I'm now going to ask you because I always ask everybody, you know, top three tips or tools mm. um, for these people because I, I, I'm sure a lot of people listening in are very, very high performing. Yeah. I think a lot of us. I, I'm speaking from personal experience. We do struggle yes. um, where where things go bad. You you focus more on the other, and then you get out of, out of out of whack. So, what are your top kind of three tips or tools? Okay, three questions. And these oh, yeah. are the three questions everyone needs to commit to memory whenever they're feeling that sort of inkling that there's a change on the horizon and maybe you want to be more proactive in that change in your life, you know, rather than feeling like you're reacting to change in your life. I always say it's like Indiana Jones, right? Remember in uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, there's that big boulder chasing them down the, the, yes. the, the pathway. Well, I think that's a metaphor for change, right? Like we're Indiana Jones. <laughs> the boulder is change, right? And, and we're run, 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 run. Um, but, but all joking aside, you know, the, these three questions I find to be very instrumental and helpful and clarifying for those that want to navigate mm -hmm. change. It doesn't matter how small or how significant. And the first question is, can I do it? You know, can I do and it being the change, right? Yeah. Second question, if I do it, will it work? <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, really, will it work? Yep. And then the third question is, is it worth it? And, you know, if I'm talking to a team or an organization, a company, sure, I can say, is it worth it? And we're talking in general terms as a group. But when I'm talking to individuals, you have to frame it, am I worth it? Am yep. I worth the change? You know, yes. that first one really, it's all about the confidence, right? Like, can I do this? Yeah. Can, can I actually make the change? Like at 15 years old, I want to get healthy. I'm morbidly obese. I'd never played sports. I was the kid that would pretend he was sick so I didn't have to go to phys ed class, you know, physical education. Like I was <laughs> very good at not doing anything. And, yeah. you know, when I decided to make the change and I'm like, I want to get healthy and I'm like, can I get healthy? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, but I'm like, well, I'm, I'm 15 years old. I'm capable. I can do stuff. I can move my body. I'm sure I can, I can do this, you know? And then it, yeah. the second question is like, okay, well, if I do actually do this and I start say moving my body with a little bit of purpose, you know, this idea of intentional weight release rather than just mm -hmm. simply going through the motions. But if I do that, will it actually work? And then for me, it was like getting magazines and getting books from the library and looking at success stories of other people that had done it. I'm like, well, if it worked for them, it's going to work for me. So if I do the same stuff, do you think it'll work? Yeah, I think it will. So I've got a yes and a yes now. My mm -hmm. confidence starts to go up. And when you feel confidence and clear, you make more decisive action and you procrastinate less. <laughs> and, and the third question, you know, am I worth it? There was days where I didn't feel that way. But that was the days that I would make sure I got around a positive community I also made sure I had my family and those that cared for me unconditionally around me. Because if I ever felt like I wasn't worth it, they were there to remind me that I was, yeah. you know, and to support me. But those three questions, I don't care what kind of change you're navigating. They're going to help. They're going to help. Yeah. And when you I get clear, it. you get confident. When you get confident, you take action. And, and yeah. those are what I would like to offer people today.
Oh, that is absolutely fantastic. I absolutely love it. Okay, so can I do it? If I do it, will it work? And is it worth it or am I worth it yeah. if it's a personal decision yeah. you're making? Brilliant. Hey, look, we've covered off so much more in this <laughs> podcast as well, so many little tips and tools, but that, that, that is a great way to finish off. Hey, Di, if anybody wants to get in contact with you and would like to you know, work with you or look at your online courses, whatever they want to do, uh, engage with you as a speaker, mm -hmm. how do they find you? Well, the cool thing about having a unique name, I'm pretty easy to find if you can spell yeah. it right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yes, and, that's true. <laughs> and um, I am very active active on, on Instagram and Facebook. Um, but I mm -hmm. also recognize that a lot of the people I work with aren't on social, but they are on LinkedIn. And as uh, such, yes. I'm very active on LinkedIn as well. So uh, I always say reach out. It's a wonderful place for us to start a conversation. And let's just, we'll talk about change. We'll talk about what's got you excited yeah. and, and what's holding you back from realizing the excitement, you know? And uh, yes. I just got to say, yeah. Deborah, thank you. You know, it's amazing that you create this platform to share these conversations with not only your audience, but the world, because we all benefit from this. We all do. Yeah. And I just want to say thank oh. you. Thank you. Really. Oh, no, look, thank you. As I said to a lot of my guests, I, I love doing these because I sit here and I, I take copious notes. I'm all this stuff is being absorbed. And it, it just reminds me as well, because, you know, I, I think I like to think that I'm doing most of the right things, but we all get distracted. We sure. all kind of end up losing yeah. um, track of things. And so it's always a really great reminder. And plus, I get to meet awesome people. So now I know next time I come to Vancouver, I can go, I die, I'm here. Can yes, please. For a kombucha? I'm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be counting on it. So when you get here, you better yeah. be saying and we're coming because there's some great restaurants there's some great walks yeah. we'll have some fun it'll be wonderful yeah, and no, I actually, I came over um, to Toronto um, earlier on this year. That was my first time ever in Canada. Wow. Uh, but I heard amazing things about Vancouver. And I yes. just didn't have a chance to do it. So next time, next I, time. I'll be there for sure. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, Di, I really, I really appreciate, I mean, I know you've been like super vulnerable. Um, I really appreciate that. I appreciate everything that you shared with me. And and just thank you. Thank you for, for being you. <laughs> thank you, Deborah. Really appreciate thank it. You. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my Entrepreneur's Playground and Event Center in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately, and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.